Ever since the world's first high-speed rail in the 1960s, Americans have dreamed of bullet trains connecting the country, but still, 60 years later, we still have old, slow, and polluting diesel-powered trains connecting the country. So how did this happen? This is American High-Speed Rail Week, a five-part documentary detailing the past, present, and future of high-speed rail in America. So without further ado, let's begin. Chapter 1. The Problem with America's Passenger Rail Network Amtrak. It's America's big red, white, and blue railroad. To rail fans like myself, Amtrak is a wonderful way to travel and see the country, but to basically everyone else, it's a slow, expensive, and outdated way to travel. Meanwhile, in Europe and Asia, trains are cheaper, faster, and more efficient than planes. So why is it that way, and can we change it? Believe it or not, the United States was not always so far behind on passenger rail technology. Let's go back to the late 1950s. Beginning in 1959, a project was started to connect Japan's two biggest cities, Tokyo and Osaka, by a train that would be able to take less than four hours. In October of 1964, Japan unveiled that train known as the Shinkansen, the world's first true high-speed rail. This train looked like no other, with a pointy and aerodynamic nose and individually powered cars as opposed to a locomotive. After getting over 200 billion yen over budget, service began on October 1, 1964, just in time for the Tokyo Olympics. The world watched as this revolutionary train made its maiden voyage over 300 miles of brand new straight track that tunneled through mountains and whatever else was in its way. In just three years, the Shinkansen had already served 100 million passengers. This inspired countries around the world to begin looking into making their own high-speed rail networks. By 1965, countries such as Germany and France already had prototypes for their own high-speed rail systems. German Federal Railways managed to get the existing Class 103 locomotive up to 120 miles per hour between Munich and Augsburg, just 10 miles per hour short of the Shinkansen stop speed. France had a proof of concept for a hovering train called the Aerotrain, which was not much of a train at all, just a hovercraft thing on a track. Later on in 1965, even the United States got in on the fun, when the High Speed Ground Transportation Act of 1965 was passed. This bill created the Penn Central Metroliner service between New York and Washington DC with the top speed of 120 miles per hour, which was completely on par with the other high-speed rail networks around the world. There were a few shortcomings of this train, such as the cars being somewhat unreliable and track conditions keeping it from going faster than 90 miles per hour for a good deal of the route, but overall the Metroliner wasn't a bad start at all. After all, the United States could have been the one that tried to put a hovercraft on rails. Two years later, in 1967, a concept train made by the United Aircraft Corporation known as the Turbotrain managed to get up to 171 miles per hour on the same line that the Metroliner used. Wait, pause. An American train in 1967 went 20 miles per hour faster than the current fastest train in the United States? Correct. To this day, the fastest train in this country, Amtrak's Acela, only gets up to 150 miles per hour in service, and that's only for a short stretch of track in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. So in 2020, Amtrak updated the track between New Brunswick, New Jersey and Trenton, New Jersey to add another 150 mile per hour segment. As the 1960s came to an end, the country's passenger rail network was becoming outdated and dilapidated as people began driving instead of taking the slower and dirtier train. This lack of ridership meant that in order for privately owned railroads around the country to stay afloat, they would have to begin cutting off all funding to their passenger routes. Railroads continued dropping their passenger services into the early 70s. In 1970, the state of American passenger rail was looking so bleak that the government had to step in and begin funding passenger services. President Richard Nixon signed the Rail Passenger Service Act into law, creating the National Railroad Passenger Corporation, later known to be Amtrak. Amtrak was to be a government-subsidized, before-profit corporation that would merge the 26 passenger rail lines across the country into one. All but six of those railroads gave up their services to Amtrak, although many of these railroads still had freight operations, meaning Amtrak would be allowed to use these routes that were previously owned by the privately owned trains, but the tracks would still be owned by the privately owned freight railroads. This ended up meaning that Amtrak to this day only owns about 600 miles of their 21,000 mile network, about 3%. The Metroliner service continued on, changing names and equipment over the years, but never going much faster than 120 miles per hour. As the rest of the world began to improve their high-speed rail, the United States made no changes to what they had, which was a relatively slow high-speed rail that serves a very tiny portion of the country. Meanwhile, everywhere else around the country had diesel-powered trains that would mostly stay below 80 miles per hour. A combination of not having enough funding and government bureaucracy made progress on any step towards the future slow and painful. The Metroliner service would continue into the 90s as America's fastest train. Meanwhile, countries like Japan and France's trains were doing upwards of 170 miles per hour in regular service. 
It seemed like all was lost until 1992 when Amtrak received funding from the government to improve its northeast corridor between New Haven and Boston. Before this, the NEC was only electrified between Washington, D.C. and New Haven, Connecticut. The New Haven to Boston line, known as the Shore Line, was to be straightened and electrified to allow for higher speeds between the two cities. Construction began in 1996 and included installing over 1,550 miles of catenary wire, 15,000 cat poles to hold up that wire, 140 miles of continuous welded rail, a new signaling system, and 25 power stations to provide electricity for the line. Just in time for the year 2000, construction was completed, right in time for, wait, the Acela? When did that happen? Well, during the course of the construction up north on the shoreline, Amtrak was working hard to provide the first true high-speed train in American history. Throughout the 90s, Amtrak had imported two trains from Europe to test their lines. The candidates were the German ICE-1 and the Swedish X-2000 high-speed train sets. Both were retrofitted with the equipment necessary to run on American lines. Both of these were initially supposed to be the exact trains that Amtrak wanted to use on the NEC, but after both showed their specific flaws, Amtrak decided they would commission their own new train. Alstom and Bombardier were contracted to build a new French TGV-inspired train, which would later be known as the Acela Express. The new Acela began service in the year 2000 to relatively positive reception, but the same issue that plagued the Metroliner also affected the Acela. The infrastructure that it ran on was not optimized for high-speed rail. Most of the line south of New Haven was built between 1830 and 1917, causing trains to stay under 100 miles per hour. Acela service continued throughout the 2000s, not changing a whole lot. In 2012, Hurricane Sandy hit the East Coast very hard, damaging infrastructure all along the Northeast Corridor, especially in the New York area. Of all the damage caused by Sandy, the most detrimental was the North River Tunnel Flood. The North River Tunnel is a vital piece of infrastructure that connects New York Penn Station to New Jersey, crossing under the Hudson River, carrying 450 trains and 200,000 people every day. During Sandy, the tunnel became flooded with salt water from the Hudson, damaging electrical infrastructure, drainage systems, and most importantly, the walls of the tunnel. Since 2012, salt water has been slowly eating away at the walls of the tunnel, and it's only a matter of time before something bad happens to these tunnels that are over 100 years old. It's extremely unlikely that these tunnels will collapse, but as time goes on, they will continue to age, and the ancient electrical equipment will begin to fail more and more, often causing delays. One of the ways Amtrak plans to improve its service includes what is known as the Gateway Project. This project has plans to build a new tunnel under the Hudson River. Amtrak said that there are two options. One is to rebuild the existing tunnel built by the PRR over 100 years ago, which would mean taking one track out of service at a time to renovate, bringing the tunnel's capacity from 24 trains per hour to 6 per hour. The other more ideal solution would be to build a completely new tunnel north of the existing one and seamlessly transition train traffic from the old one to the new one once the new one is completed. This new tunnel is estimated to cost $9.8 billion, but progress has been very slow. Former President Donald Trump refused to fund this vital program unless he got his border wall with Mexico. Luckily for Amtrak, now that Trump is out of office, Biden will be in control of this funding. President Biden has been a lifelong Amtrak supporter, and as a senator in Delaware, traveled on Amtrak daily on the same route that this project is located on. He has also picked another Amtrak fan as Secretary of Transportation, Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Secretary Buttigieg has worked with Amtrak as mayor of South Bend, Indiana, and will likely push for more funding for Amtrak. Finally, the future of this project is looking pretty bright. In addition to this tunnel, the Gateway Project also includes fixing other ancient infrastructures such as swing bridges and catenary. Amtrak has also made early proposals to improve its track conditions on the Northeast Corridor. As I mentioned earlier, the Acela hits its top speed of 150 miles per hour for only about 40 minutes of the six-hour trip between Boston and DC. In places such as Connecticut and New York, the speed limit for trains is as low as 40 miles per hour, greatly increasing trip time. It's not cheap to make these improvements, with an estimated cost of $117 billion which Amtrak doesn't have. For reference, Amtrak received $1.6 billion in funding for infrastructure projects from the government in 2019. Will Amtrak ever receive the funding to do that? Well, right now, probably not. Even though Biden is a big supporter of Amtrak, I doubt that he'll be willing to give Amtrak $117 billion. But I do think Amtrak's funding will be increased, meaning that at least some infrastructure can be improved. Amtrak is already working on improving some infrastructure in New Jersey to accommodate speeds of up to 165 miles per hour. Also, you may have noticed the elephant in the room. Amtrak's new equipment coming to the Northeast Corridor. The original Acela train sets are all 20 years old and at this point are due for replacement. In 2016, Amtrak announced that they were working with the French manufacturer Alstom to build a new fleet of high-speed trains capable of up to 220 miles per hour. For more information on those, click the video in the top right corner. These new Liberty train sets will enter service in 2021 with an initial top speed of 160 miles per hour, and Amtrak claims they'll eventually have a top speed of up to 220 miles per hour. So it seems Amtrak does expect that they'll be able to upgrade at least some of the infrastructure to handle modern high-speed rail speeds. Overall, the future is bright for Amtrak, with some projects already in progress and a president that supports it, although you may have noticed that I've only talked about the Northeast Corridor throughout the entire video. What about the rest of Amtrak's system?
While it seems as of now, Amtrak for the most part will be limited to 79 miles per hour in most places, although in recent years Amtrak has upgraded some Midwest routes to get up to 110 miles per hour, and there are plans to even get up to 125 in some places. As for long distance routes, they're not receiving any upgrades and even being decreased to three times a week, which is a good financial decision on Amtrak's part. Other than that, there aren't really any other projects going on to make Amtrak faster around the country. It seems that if Amtrak doesn't get to work soon, other profitable potential high-speed rail routes such as Los Angeles to Las Vegas and Dallas to Houston will soon be swooped up by private railroads such as Brightline and Texas Central. Luckily, Amtrak has at least realized what its main problems are. Their long-distance trains are slow and lose money, and it's financially best to start running them less, and they need to update their ancient infrastructure. Once these two issues are fixed and as the pandemic begins to end, Amtrak may finally turn a profit, which it hasn't done since its inception in 1971. Once this happens, if it ever does, not only will Amtrak have more money to spend to upgrade service, but it will show to the government that it can be an efficient railroad that deserves to be funded more. Amtrak will certainly have to be on their A-game to compete with up-and-coming private high-speed rails, but as America starts to recognize the environmental and economic benefits of trains, it'll probably become a more popular mode of transportation. This means more money, which means better trains. Chapter 2. Brightline, America's first privately funded high-speed rail. For the previous episode of High Speed Rail Week, I talked about America's government-funded rail network and their plans to upgrade their services around the country, but mostly on the Northeast Corridor. Of course, there's more to this country than just Boston, New York, and Washington, D.C. Unfortunately, for those mostly rural regions, Amtrak has almost no plans to expand its system at all. That's where up-and-coming private railroads come into the picture. If you don't like hearing about ultra-slow moving infrastructure projects and government bureaucracy, this is the episode for you. As I said in the intro, Amtrak doesn't have any money to spend on its system at the moment, so right now, private high-speed railroads have to fill in. Cities such as Miami and Orlando, Dallas and Houston, and Los Angeles and Las Vegas are currently not connected by high-speed passenger trains, or in some cases, no passenger trains of any speed. This is the exact position that Brightline fills. Brightline is America's first private high-speed rail service, so let's see where it all started. In 2012, a private company known as All Aboard Florida saw the potential market for a Miami to Orlando high-speed rail connection. The rapidly growing metropolitan area including Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and West Palm Beach was the perfect population density and distance between cities to support a high-speed rail. Better yet, there is already a relatively straight rail line connecting these cities owned by Class 2 freight railroad Florida East Coast, Florida's regional railroad running between Miami and Jacksonville. Initially, all aboard Florida planned to connect Miami and Orlando, utilizing the FEC line between Miami and Cocoa and building an all-new line between Cocoa and Orlando. Construction was planned to be $1.5 billion with no significant impact on the environment. The company applied for a $1.6 billion railroad rehabilitation and improvement financing loan in 2013. In 2014, All Aboard Florida had ordered their rolling stock. They ordered five train sets of four cars and two locomotives. Siemens was to build a fleet of 10 locomotives and 20 cars. The locomotives are essentially SC44 chargers with a more streamlined body. These locomotives were classified as SCB40s, with the S standing for Siemens, the C standing for Charger, the series of locomotives that these are a part of, the B standing for Brightline, and the 40 denoting the 4000 horsepower that these locomotives have. The cars ordered are called Siemens Venture Cars, which match the locomotives. These Venture Cars are identical to the ones that Amtrak has ordered for their state-supported services in California and the Midwest. Each train set can be identified not only by the numbers of the locomotives, but also by color. These train sets are a different color, with one set of blue, green, orange, purple, and red. By 2015, construction had begun between Miami and West Palm Beach, and later in the year, All Aboard Florida announced that they would run their service with the name Brightline and reporting mark BLF. Construction continued on the line until 2018 when construction on tracks and stations was completed between Miami and West Palm Beach. The FEC mainline was fitted with continuous welded rail and concrete ties, and the stations were built to be spacious, modern, and welcoming spaces for the passengers with snack bars, clean bathrooms, and most importantly, the scent of fresh Florida citrus. All Brightline stations are perfumed with a comforting citrus fragrance for passengers. Unlike Amtrak's, Brightline's mission statement was less to be a mode of transportation and not much else, and more of an experience, because the ride between Miami and West Palm Beach would only get up to 79 miles per hour, not a whole lot faster than 95. Brightline wanted to offer a service that was relaxing and enjoyable and additionally a little faster than driving. Brightline began testing in late 2017 and made its maiden voyage between Fort Lauderdale and West Palm Beach on January 13th, 2018, and later on the first train to originate in Miami ran on May 19th, 2018. Brightline was praised for being an affordable and welcoming experience, but it wasn't so well received all around. Throughout the year, Brightline received many noise complaints about train horns in communities near the tracks. 
Attempts were made to implement quiet zones, but when a train collided with a car and killed the driver in 2019, it was decided that trains should be limited to 79 miles per hour, so quiet zones could be permitted. We begin with breaking news in Aventura, a deadly crash involving a Brightline train and an SUV. Hey, local 10's Christian Delaverse alive now on the scene for us with this developing story. Christian. A lot of questions as to how this collision exactly went down. Police are, of course, investigating, but it appears uh, that the collision may have happened at the intersection of Dixie and 203rd Street and that the train then pushed a vehicle all the way to where it sits right now. Let me. The quiet zones consist of quad gates as well as bollards at lower traffic crossings. There are more than 110 grade crossings on the 70 mile corridor which prevented Brightline from implementing the 110 mile per hour speeds they hoped for. Also, back in 2018, Brightline was bought by the Virgin Group and trains would be rebranded to Virgin Trains USA and the Young Railroad would purchase Express West, another private high-speed rail that is planned to connect Los Angeles and Las Vegas. 2018 was a big year for Brightline, but 2019 would not be nearly as action-packed. Ridership would begin to increase to 885000 in 2019 and $1.75 billion in funding would be secured for the extension to Orlando. This project was to be the first track that Brightline would build from scratch. Construction began immediately with welded rail and ties being dropped off in Cocoa where the line would depart from the Florida East Coast. This all new line is supposed to be completed in late 2021 with service beginning in 2022. This new line will use the existing FEC tracks between West Palm Beach and Cocoa hitting speeds of up to 110 miles per hour hopefully, and an all new grade separated line that will parallel State Route 528 that will allow trains to go 125 miles per hour between Cocoa and Orlando. You can already see where construction is being done on the side of the highway on Google Maps. This service will terminate at the brand new terminal at Orlando International Airport, where the station has already been constructed. A maintenance facility is also planned to be constructed near the airport for trains to refuel and be repaired. Trip times between Miami and Orlando are planned to be 3 hours one way, which is 15 minutes faster than driving, but much more comfortable. As 2020 rolled in, so did the COVID-19 pandemic, which meant that Brightline had to temporarily suspend all service on May 25th, 2020. Hopefully Brightline will be able to open back up in 2021. Until then, construction on the Orlando expansion will continue and surprisingly progress wasn't delayed too much by the pandemic, so service to Orlando should still be starting on time. In late 2020, Brightline also announced its further future plans. These plans include building more stations along the route, including Port Miami, Aventura, Boca Raton, Stewart, and Coco. All of these stations are on the FEC mainline. It was also announced that the line will continue west of Orlando to Tampa. Intermediate stops between these two cities will include Disney Springs and Lakeland, plus a brand new terminal to be built in Ybor City in Tampa. There's also been talk of expanding the line north of Cocoa to Jacksonville, utilizing the entire FEC mainline. Whatever happens, it seems that Brightline is doing just fine, despite running into issues such as financial instability, pushback from communities surrounding the tracks, and even a pandemic. It's safe to say that Brightline is doing quite a good job building a railroad. Not only is Brightline just a good way to travel across Florida, but it's also a proof of concept that private high-speed rail is possible in today's economic climate. With Brightline acquiring another high-speed rail project within the first few years of its inception, it's very likely that they will soon acquire another. Brightline is quickly building a network of environmentally friendly, modern, and efficient high-speed trains that may very well eventually become bigger than Amtrak. As I said in the last episode, Amtrak will certainly need to be on their A-game to stay competitive with private carriers such as Brightline. Chapter 3 Brightline West, High Speed Rail for Las Vegas? When you think of two cities that people often travel between in the United States, quite a few come to mind. Of these cities, there are a few remaining ones that aren't connected by rail, but one of the most untapped markets is Los Angeles to Las Vegas, a 300 mile trip that currently has no passenger rail at all. For today's episode of High Speed Rail Week, we'll be connecting the City of Angels to Sin City by High Speed Rail. Right now if you wanted to get from Los Angeles to Las Vegas using public transit, the only option you have is Greyhound, which takes 5.5 hours and costs you $40 and whatever medical bills you may incur from the diseases you might be infected with on the bus. Other than that, you can drive yourself, get an Uber or a taxi that'll cost you all the money that you would gamble away in Las Vegas, or you could fly, which is also pretty expensive. 
This vital route at one point was connected by a train, but that train, Amtrak's Desert Wind, took a whopping 7 hours to get between these two cities, and that's assuming it was on time. As you would expect, this service was cut in 1997, and since then there has been no passenger train to connect these cities. Over the years, ideas and concepts had been thrown around regarding a high-speed rail connecting the two cities, but like the high-speed rail slated to connect Northern California and Southern California, it was probably bound to be stuck in a planning stage forever unless a private company picked up the project, as opposed to the government starting construction 40 years behind schedule. Luckily, in 2005, a private company known as Desert Express set out to do just that, build a high-speed rail link between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. Planning began in 2006 with environmental impact studies and a construction plan. This project was to be split into two phases, phase one being the line between Las Vegas, Nevada and Victorville, California, a small city just north of San Bernardino located a little over an hour northeast of downtown LA, and phase two being the line from Victorville to Los Angeles. By 2010, Desert Express had calculated that the line would cost $5 billion to build between Las Vegas and Victorville. Project planners said that the project would be funded through private investors, but they also applied for a loan from the government. By the end of the year, the route for the service was planned and approved. This new route was to be built as an all-new track mostly between the two lanes of I-15, which was already a straight route from Victorville to Las Vegas. Construction was planned to begin in early 2012 and to be completed in late 2016. As 2012 came closer, Desert Express ran into more and more problems regarding funding as the load still wasn't approved for any reasons. More years came and went with even more talk and yet no action to back it up. Desert Express was rebranded to Express West, now with plans to build a high-speed rail network that connected Arizona, Utah, Colorado, in addition to California and Nevada. By 2015, Express West still hadn't secured the funding from the government and decided to look for alternative funding. Express West and China International USA, a group of Chinese rail companies, announced a joint venture project to finally construct a line that had been in planning since 2012. Of course, not before long, this plan fell through too. At this point, it was 2016, and if construction had started four years ago when it was originally planned, the project would almost be done. The project continued to struggle to find funding until 2018 when a new investor came along. This time it was Fortress Investment Group, the same company that owns Brightline. On September 18th, 2018, it was announced that the project would be taken over once again by Fortress Investment Group, and construction would finally actually begin in mid-2020. Additionally, the project would be rebranded again, this time to Brightline West. Brightline laid out a clear plan for what construction was to be done, and soon enough land had been purchased for both stations for phase one of the project, with the Las Vegas station being just south of Las Vegas International Airport and about 10 minutes from the heart of the Strip, and Victorville Station which was to be called Victor Valley Station. The specific location of this station is still to be determined. The entire line between these two stops would be electrified and double-tracked with a maintenance facility north of Victor Valley, and the tracks would be built between the two lanes of I-15, the interstate between LA and Las Vegas. Building tracks next to highways is something Brightline is also doing in Florida for their all-new line between Cocoa and Orlando, which I discussed in the last episode. I think this is an ingenious way to build a high-speed rail because not only is the highway straight enough for high-speed trains, but the land is already basically cleared, it's better for the environment, and it's cheaper for the railroad to purchase. This line is expected to be completed by 2023 with service beginning between Victorville and Las Vegas in 2024, and unlike most American high-speed rails, this one might actually be built on time, as Brightline has a pretty good track record in terms of timely project completion. After Phase 1 is complete, construction will begin for Phase 2 with station stops at Rancho Cucamonga and finally Los Angeles Union Station. At this point, it's unknown what exact route trains will take, and even when Phase 2 will be completed, as right now, Brightline has barely even started Phase 1. In addition to the line to Las Vegas, this project also includes a branch line from Victor Valley to Palmdale, which will connect to the dreaded California high-speed rail if that ever gets completed. After that, the possibilities are endless. As I said earlier, Brightline wants to look into expanding its system even further, which may mean this line reaching further east than Las Vegas potentially even as far east as Colorado or maybe even Texas. Who knows? The possibilities are pretty much endless. Brightline seems to be the first competent private American high-speed rail. Their construction projects tend to stay on time, their trains are fast and clean, and the company itself seems to be managed by actual adults. So unlike when I hear politicians who know nothing about trains talk about California high-speed rail, I believe what I hear when Brightline says it wants to expand even further. It's nice to hear that the West Coast is finally getting the same amount of attention in terms of high-speed rail projects that the East Coast is getting. Chapter 4, California's High-Speed Rail Disaster If you've been paying attention to American high-speed rail politics, there's one project that sticks out like a sore thumb. It's potentially the most profitable high-speed railroad imaginable, and it's a route that isn't even currently connected by any direct rail link. You guessed it, it's the California High-Speed Rail Project.
High-speed rail connecting two of California's largest cities, Los Angeles and San Francisco, has always been a dream for Californians since the 1990s, but it all started when Los Angeles started to improve its public transit systems. Throughout the 60s and 70s, Los Angeles was one of the fastest growing cities in America, and with a rapidly growing economy came the need for public transit. In 1973, the Southern California Association of Governments conducted a study as to whether a commuter rail would benefit Los Angeles. The state recommended two round trips per day between Oxnard and Los Angeles. This train was to utilize the Southern Pacific Coastline, a single line track between the two aforementioned cities. Despite broad public approval of the project, Southern Pacific objected to the proposal, saying that the four additional trains per day would disrupt freight traffic. After almost 10 years of back and forth between the two agencies, an agreement was finally reached and service would begin on October 18, 1982, under the moniker Caltrain. No, not that Caltrain. A slower Caltrain that was operated by Southern Pacific. After about a year of trains, the service was found to be wildly unpopular, but it continued with weak ridership and dilapidated equipment until March 1st, 1983, when a storm wiped out the trestle bridge along the line. The bridge was planned to be repaired, and service was supposed to resume after that, but when the bridge was fixed, Caltrain never returned. With almost no public transit in Los Angeles, the city continued to rapidly expand well into the 1990s. Instead of trains, the city used buses, which contributed to a few things LA was known for in the 1990s, smog, graffiti, and traffic. The state, recognizing the problem, quickly put a plan into action. First, Amtrak began a service to connect Los Angeles to San Juan Capistrano, known as the Orange County Commuter, which was supposed to be a temporary filler for what was to come. On May 25, 1990, Senate Bill 1402 was signed into law, requiring the state to come up with a plan for Southern California high-speed rail service by the end of that year. By October of 1990, the state had purchased 175 miles of track from the Southern Pacific, and by 1991, service was almost ready to commence with a fleet of Bombardier bi-level cars and F-59 PHs in a clean new Metrolink paint scheme. The first day of service was on October 26, 1992 on the Ventura, Santa Clarita, and San Bernardino lines. This service turned out to be vastly more popular with commuters as the trains were clean, new, and fast. By 1993, the Riverside line was completed and the Orange County line service had been transferred from Amtrak to Metrolink. Throughout the rest of the 90s and early 2000s, the service was continuously expanded and Metrolink still runs to this day, but that's a story for another time. Let's go back to the early 90s when Metrolink was still being planned, specifically 1996. In 1996, the California High Speed Rail Authority, which I'll refer to as the CHSRA, was formed to start planning a high-speed rail ballot measure for 1998 or 2000. This plan was created to keep California from falling behind in terms of having a viable high-speed rail network like the Northeast. By 1998, a plan had been laid out for a high-speed rail system that would connect parts of California that had previously never been connected by a passenger train of any speed. The plan began with two phases. Phase 1 would connect San Francisco with Los Angeles via the Central Valley, and Phase 2 would expand the line north from San Francisco to Sacramento, and south from Los Angeles to San Diego. In the election of 2000, this bill was approved and environmental studies began. By 2008, the CHSRA was ready to build, and voters approved $9 billion in funding to begin construction of the state-owned high-speed rail. By 2011, the federal government funded the program another $6 billion, and the project continued to be funded for a few more years, yet no construction began. In 2012, the project was approved by Governor Jerry Brown, yet there was still not enough funding, and there was no concrete plan for construction. The project was barely planned out, and the government continued to throw money at it in hopes of fixing the management issues. I guess that finally paid off, as on January 6, 2015, the ground was finally broken for construction on the project. Not bad, only 20 years from conception to groundbreaking. Unlike other high-speed rail systems under construction around the country, most of the line would be elevated as to not disrupt what's going on on the ground as much, and to not slow down trains with grade crossings. This meant the project would be a lot more expensive, but in turn the trains would be faster. Travel times between San Francisco and Los Angeles will be projected to be under 3 hours with an average speed of 200 miles per hour. Since this project was modeled off the high-speed rail networks in Europe and Asia, it would need some fitting, non-American looking trains. So in January of 2015, as construction was beginning, California High-Speed Rail Authority issued a request for complete train sets with a list of requirements which are as follows. Train sets must be able to sustain continuous speeds of up to 220 miles per hour, have a top speed of 242 miles per hour, a lifespan of at least 30 years, a length no longer than 680 feet, the ability to double up trains as they do in Japan and France, not exceed 26 decibels at 220 miles per hour, have at least 450 seats and carry 8 bicycles, have business class and first class, have space for wheelchairs, have food service, be optimized for onboard internet, and have earthquake safety systems because California is prone to earthquakes. Ten separate companies expressed interest in building these cars, and now in 2021 that number has been whittled down to seven companies due to companies merging and going bankrupt. As of right now, all we know is that the railroad will initially purchase 15 to 20 trains, but eventually there will be as many as 95 train sets for phase one from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Right now, the railroad is using this rendered image of what trains will look like, but this is nothing more than a mock-up. Trains may look completely different. 
Overall, the California High Speed Rail project is the furthest behind and the slowest moving, but it seems that President Biden wants to make big steps towards American High Speed Rail, so it may not be much longer before this project really starts moving. If California High Speed Rail is ever completed, it may be the largest and fastest high speed rail in the country. Who knows? Chapter 5 Texas Central Railway, bringing Japan's bullet train to America. Texas, the Lone Star State, home to lots of wide open land and some of the fastest growing cities in America. Texas is the first perfect place for high speed rail. So who will build this route? How fast will the trains be? And how do they plan to make a bullet train that can stand up to Japan's? Nowadays, you probably hear the name Texas Central Railway quite often in reference to high-speed rail in Texas, but it hasn't always been that way. Back in 2009, some investors were inspired by California high-speed rail to look for another potentially profitable route for high-speed rail. Seeing that Texas is one of the fastest growing states in America in terms of population, connecting Houston and Dallas seemed like a no-brainer. These investors founded a company called Lone Star High Speed Rail LLC with a simple goal, connect Dallas to Houston in 90 minutes or less. This ambitious goal would essentially mean that trains would travel almost 250 miles in an hour and a half, meaning trains would have to keep an average speed of around 165 miles per hour with a straight line route between the two cities. This goal time of 90 minutes would cut the travel time in half between these two cities from the current 3.5 hour drive to a 1.5 hour train ride. The plan was to build a track as straight as possible between the two cities with an additional stop at Brazos Valley near College Station, Texas. After a long wait, the company, now known as Texas Central Railway, publicly announced that they had secured $75 million in private funding to allow for construction to begin. Unfortunately, there were some bumps along the way. Texas Central began conducting environmental tests in the areas that they planned to build the line, and many residents were concerned about their property value being affected by the grade-separated tracks, as in order to have straight tracks through towns, tracks would have to be elevated as to not be slowed down by grade crossings. Other landowners happily gave their support to the train, signing land agreements, though lawsuits and news stories slowed down the project a little bit. Soon enough, the company began to plan a project, and they decided on a few preferred routes, and even picked out their ideal rolling stock. From the beginning, Texas Central wanted N700s nearly identical to those used on Japan's Tokaido Shinkansen. For a while, Texas Central was leaning towards the N700i train set, which was an N700 that was slightly modified for export, but as the years went on, JR released an updated version of the N700 known as the N700S, with improved technology and aerodynamics, so right now that's what it sounds like they want to use. Trains in the US would have 8 cars and a top speed of 205 miles per hour. They also decided to use a similar signaling system to Japan, known as the Digital ATC system. This system is great for trains traveling at speeds near 200 miles per hour because the signals are on a monitor in the cab. When you're going that fast, it's hard to even make out what aspect a wayside signal is displaying. In January of 2017, Former President Donald Trump declared this project as a national transportation infrastructure priority. Construction was planned to begin in 2019. Not only would the construction create a fast way to travel between Texas's two biggest cities, but it was also projected to create 10,000 jobs each year and 1,500 permanent ones. By May of 2018, Texas Central announced their ticketing partnership with Amtrak, meaning people could use Amtrak.com to buy tickets for Texas Central. If I had to guess, this might also mean that if private funding ever falls through, Amtrak might take over construction and eventually service on this line especially considering how much President Biden loves trains, but I suppose I'm getting ahead of myself. What this definitely means is that there will be an Amtrak and Texas Central transfer station in both Houston and Dallas. Amtrak also offered up training and marketing services to help Texas Central. The two railroads are also working together to sync the schedules of both Amtrak and Texas Central trains to make transfers to and from trains easier. The FRA has also been helping out Texas Central. In September of 2019, the FRA began rulemaking for safety regulations along this route, known as the Rule of Particular Applicability. These rules will be special for Texas Central, as Texas Central is a new type of railroad for the United States. These rules were completed a year after in September of 2020, and it's the most recent update that we have. Texas Central plans to begin construction in 2021. They say it will take 5-6 to six years to construct, with testing beginning in 2025, but knowing how slow almost all construction projects are in the US, it might take longer. Once construction is complete, testing will last a year or two, depending on how well it goes. Finally, service will begin in 2026. The total cost of the project is supposed to be around $20 billion, and that includes building all the lines, viaducts, and all other infrastructure, as well as power substations, maintenance facilities, stations, and rolling stock. Over the next 25 years, the project is expected to have a direct economic impact of about $36 billion, effectively paying for itself. On top of that, Texas Central is privately owned, meaning it will pay taxes to the state to improve surrounding areas. In conclusion, Texas Central was once thought of as a distant 
dream, but it's clear that Texas Central is a well-organized company and it won't be too much longer before it's a reality. As with all construction projects, things can change instantly, but right now the future is bright despite setbacks caused by the pandemic. I remain hopeful for the future of Texas High Speed Rail and hope it becomes a reality. We'll just have to wait and see. Chapter 6 Conclusion Hey guys, Sam here. If you made it this far in the video, I just want to personally thank you for watching. This was easily the hardest I've ever worked on a single video, and in fact, this one video is the culmination of almost three months of work. I don't really have much else to say, but thank you for watching, and also thank you to those who helped me. Shout out to writer of the Texas Central episode, Petru of the Amtrak Productions YouTube channel, and my audio engineer who edited my voiceovers, Jake of the Volivagog YouTube channel. Go check them out. Other than that, thank you for watching. Also, I might not upload for a few weeks as I might randomly decide to take a break after working on this video every day for the past month. Well, anyways, this is Sam from the Worldwide Rail Fan YouTube channel signing off.